All right, everyone, listen up. Tom, your job is going to be tossing cookies like they're ninja stars. You mean my biscuits? Oh, stop being a British stereotype, man. It's not working for you. Amy, you're going to be on tomato soup duty. I will burn them all. Okay. I feel like I should be concerned about that response, but I'm just going to pretend like I didn't hear it for plausible deniability. Santi, you sharpen those carrots to a deadly point. You got it. And Lee, whatever you're throwing, just make sure you have better aim than a stormtrooper. Um, you do realize that stormtroopers have have excellent aim and that the stereotype of them missing was an intentional misdirect, right? Uh, like I know, like, Lee. I know. It, it was a joke. It was a joke. He's still talking, theorists. isn't he? I'm just saying, Matt, you should learn the lore. Okay, great. Everyone ready? Food fight! Mr. Patrick. Uh, guys, a little help here? Guys? Guys? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Food Theory, where our motto is always make lunch, not war. Actually, in this episode, we're going to be doing a little bit of both as we finally dive into one of the quintessential aspects of school culture, the food fight. <laughs> simple concept. Food gets thrown, someone screams, food fight, and chaos ensues. And I'm not just talking about your run-of-the-mill tossing a peas at your friend or your drive-by pie in the face. I am talking full-scale pandemonium. <laughs> Food and drink flying around, stained clothing, pudding stuck in your hair, all while the CEO of Tide counts their money in the corner. Food fights are one of the things that pop culture has convinced me happens in literally every American school. And yet, I've never seen one. I've never been around one. I don't know anyone who's ever experienced one. So clearly, either the movies have been lying to me, or my moment is still coming. And I think the answer there is pretty obvious. My moment is coming. Which means that when it happens, and it will happen, I don't want to waste my chance. I need to come in prepared and so do you, which is why today's episode exists. When you get into your inevitable food fight, what is the best strategy to win? Oh, I'm sorry, you weren't aware that there were winners and losers in a random melee of people launching food at each other? Didn't you see the second word of the phrase? It is called a food fight, and with any fight, there are always going to be those who come out on top and those who are at the bottom. And we theorists, we are nothing if not winners here. So break out your plastic trays, thermoses, and lunchables, friendos. It's time to dive into Matt Pat's food fight strategy guide. When the inevitable food apocalypse arises, what do you hope you packed in your superhero lunchbox to win the number one victory royale? First, we should probably set our criteria for what exactly winning the food fight means, because really, we could be talking about three very different styles of fight here. One is the traditional food fight, covering your enemies with the most possible food and staining their clothing so they continue to feel the sting of defeat later on laundry day. Option two, literally trying to use normal food to knock out your opponent, hurling honey crisps at heads until they all lie unconscious at your feet. He who is still alive and breathing at the end wins the day. And of course, there's always option number three, where you refine your food stuff into the ultimate killing machine. A scythe of celery, a beet bludgeon, a granola gun. This, my friends, is where your food is actually transformed into a weapon to fight with. Really brings new meaning to the phrase lamb shank. Anyway, since the last two options would likely land you with some sort of a criminal charge, we're gonna be sticking with our first route, getting your opponents as messy and stained as possible. And in true food fight fashion, our original Arena shall be a typical American school cafeteria, blaring fluorescent lights and all. According to the North American food equipment manufacturers, a cafeteria fit for 100 people would get us in the ballpark of 1,600 square feet, or a 40 foot by 40 foot room. So with our conditions all set, let's strategize, starting with our attack position. The first food's been flung, the powder keg's about to erupt. So where are we dropping, boys? Now, you might initially be thinking, Matt Pat, I'm not trying to win a food fight, I'm just trying to get out of there without ruining my new Jordans. And I feel ya, I wouldn't want to stain my recent recently restocked Matt Pat Signature Jacket Turquoise Edition available on theorywear.com while supplies last either. As such, your first instinct would probably be to dive under the lunch table. And that makes intuitive sense. It provides cover from debris and gets you out of the line of sight. However, while well, sure, you might be safe from some food that falls from the air, it also makes you a sitting duck. Those lunch tables are a nightmare to climb out from under, especially if you're talking about the fold-up ones with built-in benches. As such, if someone notices you hiding, you have nowhere left to go before you get ketchuped. <laughs> Nope, if you're trying to get yourself out of the line of fryer, your saving grace on your lunch tray is, well, could it be the lunch tray itself? It's perfect for blocking stray applesauce, funnel cakes, and all those watery fruit cups. If you want to get out of the food fight before it even begins, you need to empty your tray as fast as possible and quickly back up to the nearest wall. This will help protect your blind spot. That way you can start defending yourself from all the tater tots and subpar pizza that's whizzing past your face. Plus, as we're about to discuss, most food is not aerodynamic or stable enough to make it all the way across a typical cafeteria. As such, you being 
being at the edge of the room is gonna result in most attacks landing long before they ever get close to your kicks. I mean, have you ever even tried to throw a slice of bologna? I feel embarrassed for it, flopping around in the breeze. That thing is barely making it a few inches, let alone dozens of feet, leaving your feet nice and clean. That said, this is your once-in-a-lifetime food fight moment here. If you're not taking full advantage of the opportunity to fling some foodstuffs in the hopes of staying completely clean, you might technically win the battle, but you're losing in spirit. Which means that the best defense here is gonna be a strong offense. And knowing that our victory conditions mandate food sticking on our opponent, staining their clothing, and not knocking them unconscious, anything that could bounce right off or cause serious bodily injury is automatically ruled out. Remember, we're trying to cause a food mess, not a legal one. So hurling apples, water bottles, silverware, all of that's a no-go. Other relatively useless foods here include cold cuts, chips, you mean crisps. I don't. Breads, most proteins like hot dogs and hamburgers, as well as french fries. Uh, chips. I already said chips, Tom. Try to stick with me here. But while throwing a bottle of water might be a bad idea, spraying a bottle of water or another liquid can be a definite win if you're doing it right. Not only making an immediate visual difference in your opponent, but also making them stickier for all subsequent attacks. Milk, water, juice, all of them are readily available in a typical cafeteria, and they can travel far provided that you know what you're doing. Well, it might be tempting to yeet those milk cartons and juice boxes home when they're gonna pop like a water balloon. Odds are, that's not gonna happen. Structurally, those paper containers are glued too tightly for that. Instead, if you can just get your hands on anything with a spray tip, like those Gatorade bottles with the twist cap, that is gonna be your best option. Or even better, you can give yourself a makeshift super soaker by taking a trusty pen from your backpack and poking a hole in the cap of a water bottle. Just give it a good squeeze, and suddenly you have a Dasani delivery service that'll douse the field. So, how effective would a MacGyvered super soaker be in this sort of scenario? Well, let's compare it to an actual super soaker. According to CNET's best water guns for 2023, the Temi Super Blaster water guns have a similar capacity to an average 500 milliliter bottle of water that you find in most vending machines. They conducted an experiment that tested soak factor, or capacity divided by empty time. Essentially, how quickly you can expel all the liquid from the container onto someone else. The Temi's 500 milliliters of water was pumped out in roughly two seconds and traveled a whopping 32 feet. But again, remember, that's a well-designed water gun that has an air pump meant to expel the water further. In our testing of makeshift water bottle soakers, we were able to squeeze the water out in the same amount of time and get half the distance. 16 feet, or just under half the length of the cafeteria. Not too shabby. In short, a water bottle should be your first choice of offense as soon as the fight breaks out. You can run to the back wall while spraying people in short range, priming them for all the food you're about to pummel them with. That said, your best case scenario is gonna be if you have a plastic bottle of chocolate milk. That way, you can start your opponents off cold, wet, and brown. As far as sodas go, my hope is that their high sugar content and explosive carbonation could create some quick and sticky chaos, but alas, the caps are much thicker and harder to poke through when it comes to the plastic bottles, and while shaking and tossing a can seemed like it could be a winning scenario, more often than not, you wound up with a dud where you got more on yourself than the opponent. Meaning, if I want to win this food fight, I'm gonna have to leave the Diet Coke behind. By the way, this is just a question for the comments, but does your school allow sodas? Because I know mine didn't for a really long time. Let me know down in the comments. I'm curious where it sits these days. Alright, enough about drinks. Let's move on to the main course. What actual food would be best in a food fight. Let's place ourselves in the crocs of a child when the food fight erupts. What traits should we be considering for our potential projectile? First things first, we need to prioritize throwability. If you've ever been in a snowball fight and you had the misfortune of using loose powdery snow, then you know that structural integrity is gonna make us or break us here. We need to find foods that, when thrown, actually make it all the way to the target. Well, you may be able to get a nice handful of spaghetti or mac and cheese. When thrown, there's gonna be a wide berth of sauce and cheese flying everywhere. Basically, those guys are like the shot gun of food fighting. Widespread, high damage, but short range. So what cafeteria food should we be reaching for if we want to maximize throwability? The obvious answer to me, and to America's Diner Denny's, is the good old mashed potato. And for the gravy on top, make a little hole in the center and pour some gravy in. Close that hole up and BAM! Exploding mashed tater ball. And the odds are in your favor that mashed potatoes are gonna be around. Looking across a wide smattering of school lunch menus, on average, the humble mashed tater is offered as a side dish at least every week and a half. Assuming it's not a mashed potato today, though, other foods that would serve a very similar function in the heat of battle would include gobs of meatloaf, bread or rolls that were dipped in water, cups of pudding, and wadded up pizza balls. Rule number two, find food, preferably pizza. Pizza balls. Now, it's one thing to make a good splat with your food fighting, but if you want the damage to really set in, well, that's when you need to start focusing on the stains setting in. So what's gonna provide us some launchability while also creating some of the most stubborn stains to get out? Well, at the top of the stubborn stain list is blood, not great, and poop, which isn't served in school cafeterias, I hope. But you know what notoriously awful stain can be easily found in the cafeteria? Ketchup. Oh yeah. That red paste that turns even the driest of meatloafs edible will now make your victory taste that much better. You see, ketchup is 
usually made out of three main ingredients, the first of which is tomato sauce. Now, tomato sauce is usually rich in tannins, a naturally occurring substance derived in the roots, fruit, bark, and wood of some foods like coffee, tea, or in this case, tomato. Historically, tannins have been used in the creation of dyes because of how well they bind to fabrics, so it's no wonder that ketchup stains are among some of the most stubborn. The other two ingredients in ketchup, vinegar and sugar, help the red dye set in deeper by weakening the fabric and leaving visible marks if not treated correctly. This one-two combo means that you're gonna be needing more than a tied to go pen to get this one out. Don't waste it all on a squeeze. Instead, load that ketchup onto some chicken nuggets. Did someone say nugget? Nugget loves the nuggets. The crispy, tender, golden perfection. That way we can coat our nugs in ketchupy goodness and launch them clear across the cafeteria. Their size gives you good launchability and their number gives you a good rapid fire option. Another high stain route to go here, blueberries. A blueberry's high sugar content can cause deep stains, especially the longer they're left on the clothing. Blueberries also get their color from the compound anthocyanin, which is one of the chemicals that we use to dye fabrics. So much like tannins, it makes sense that this stuff is gonna set into the clothing very well. One other bonus to everything we've talked about so far is that they all offer more than one round of ammunition. Multiple blueberries, repeated sprays of water, rounds of ketchup-soaked nuggets soaring through the air. That combo will supply us with more than enough firepower to last us until the teachers break up the fight. That said, we should also probably grab ourselves a breakfast item just in case it's an early day food fight. And what breakfast item can be easily launched, creates a nice satisfying splat, and has the bonus effect of making your classmates smell like they're 70 years old? Let's recruit Mr. Quaker Oats himself, Oatmeal. Whether you want to grab globs by the hand or use your spoon for precision striking, Oatmeal is going to be your best breakfast option. And just like that, I think our meal's complete. As a side bonus, while constructing the perfect balance of firepower and staining, we also happen to build a lunch that meets the USDA's National School Lunch Program standard for a balanced meal, hitting all five major food categories. We got our fruits in the form of blueberries, potatoes count as a veggie, somehow. We got our dairy fill with chocolate milk, our whole grains through our oatmeal, and even meaty, nuggety goodness. We are getting the recommended balance of foods that'll help us grow big and strong, and then we're gonna use that bigness and strongness to become the food fight champion. Oh, sure, on the surface, we look like any ordinary lunchgoer, but hidden in our food choices are the right pieces that'll get us prepared in case we have to defend our honor against a culinary crusade, a delicious dogfight, a cafeteria conflict. Just, uh, do me a favor and, uh, you know, don't start the food fight yourself. That right there, that's a one-way ticket to the principal's office. Seriously, it is not worth it. Just know that when the time comes, you will be there, armed with this video and knowledge. Knowledge that'll let you dominate. But hey, that's just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. <laughs> And hey, speaking of school lunches, if you want to learn just how sketchy they are, munch on the button to the left. Or if you want to learn just how broken school dress codes are, that button's on your right. As always, my friends, stay hungry for knowledge, and I'll see you next week.